Bible, you can uh, follow along. We're looking um, in a series here in the book of 2 Peter. It's a very short letter uh, in the New Testament, 2 Peter. Today we're at chapter 3, uh, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. And so when you're looking at that, you're like, well, we're going to wrap this up next week, and that is true. Uh, next week we'll finish this up, um, this short letter, but a powerful letter, a letter that the Apostle Peter wrote, and he wrote it to encourage um, he wrote about hard things, things that I think um, people have a hard time hearing. Uh, we do certainly in our time and day, and as Peter's as well, but he really meant it for us to know the truth and be filled with the truth and encouraged by it. And so uh, today we're going to look at a, a tough topic. Um, we're looking at judgment, the judgment day. And so, uh, but Peter wants us to know this for our good. So uh, follow along, Second Peter 3, I'm going to look at verses 1 through 10. Uh, remember, this is not just any word. This is the Word of God, um, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is right here with you. As close as your next breath, the Holy Spirit is right here. So we have every opportunity to hear God speak to us. Let's listen for him. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, Everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we confess... Um, our neediness uh, that you would teach us, that you would speak um, in a, a way that would bring us uh, life. Uh, we don't live on bread alone. We live on every word that comes from your mouth, God. So would you feed us again this day? Uh, we are hungry. We are your people by your work, by your hand. And so uh, we look to you now. Um, and we look with expectation because you are good and your love for us is, is amazing. And so, um, Lord, we are grateful for this time as you teach us now in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we were, uh, I was actually just talking right before the service. We were just chatting a little bit, and I have this habit um, I was reminded of, which is, I don't think it's a bad habit, but that's just me, I guess. But I, I have this habit of, I like to read the end of a book, First, I know that's like that's really wrong. It's a sin somewhere in the Bible. But I like to read the end of a book. I like to know how a story's going to end, um, and then I like to read it from the beginning on. I know for some people, like ruins the whole thing, Cliff. Why are you doing that? But um, I really do like to know how it's going to end out, how it's going to turn out. So today, uh, I just want to mention the greatest story ever told is a true story. It is the true story of how God created everything, including us, and then the whole course of history is God seeking after his very own creation made in his image, which has rejected him. 
seeking to save us who are lost. And this is the whole story of the Bible. From beginning to end, you have a God who is constantly seeking us. We tend to think of it, oh, I seek God or I'm looking for God. or It's always the other way around. God is the one who seeks after us. And so the very pinnacle of this story is Jesus. The whole story is about Jesus. But when you get to Jesus, you see God says, here's how I'm going to rescue people who are lost in their sin. Don't even know they're lost in many cases, but here's how it's going to do it. I'm going to send my only son, and I'm going to send him to be human, God incarnate, God in the flesh, with no extra advantages. He has to be born like we are. He has to be raised. He's completely helpless as a baby. This is God in the flesh. And so he's raised. He lives a life just like you and me, which means he is tempted in every way. But here's the significant difference. He doesn't sin. So he faces every challenge, every temptation you and I have ever faced. But when he comes to that moment of battle, he overcomes. He, he succeeds where we all fail. And this was God's plan. Because now my son, having lived a perfect life, offers his life as a perfect sacrifice. He dies on the cross for us. And then, of course, he rises from the dead which means not just that he has conquered death and that he's been proven to be the Son of God, the Messiah King, but also now he has his life and he's able to give us his life for our own. And we're able to receive his life and do things that we could not do on our own. So by the Holy Spirit living in us, we have the life of Jesus in us and we can live a new life. But the story doesn't end there. Jesus, after he rose from the dead, he spent a good, while, a good while showing himself to many, many witnesses to prove that he was risen from the dead. And then, after a little bit, he ascended to heaven. We don't hear a whole lot about the ascension. It's in Acts chapter 1. Um, but the ascension of Jesus into heaven, where it's, we're told he, he sits at the right hand of God the Father, enthroned. This is to show he is the true King of kings, Lord of lords. But before he ascended, he said, I'm going away, but I'm also telling you, I'm promising you, I'm coming back. I promise I'm coming back so that you could be with me, that we could be together forever. This is what God planned from the beginning. Sin has run its course, but now God has said, now I've, I've overcome sin. And all who put their trust in Jesus then can be saved. But it's this coming back that Peter wants to draw to our attention today. Peter talks about it. He uses some phrases here. We're going to use, talk about the phrase he uses, the day of the Lord. He says in verses 4 and 7 and 10, he mentions this coming that he promised. Jesus said he's going to come back one day. He calls it the day of judgment, judgment day, the destruction of the ungodly, or the day of the Lord. And Peter wants us to know it's coming. It will come. Now, this is one of those things that's very hard for us to say, okay, I got it. He's going to come back someday. I just kind of put that thought on the shelf. Don't really think about it too much because nobody knows when it's going to be, so why worry about it? Peter brings it to the forefront here because what he's trying to say is if you're really going to overcome in this life and we still battle sin, but now we have the power of Christ in us, you have to be convinced and you have to know, like in your gut, he really is coming. And what's going to happen when he comes? How is that connected to how I live now? This is so important that Peter brings it to our attention. He says this is really important to know. The day itself, the day of judgment, well, how does the Bible describe that? Let me just give you a couple passages here from Matthew 12 and 2 Corinthians 5. Jesus is talking in Matthew 12 when he says, but I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. And then 2 Corinthians 5 says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us, us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So let that blow your mind just for a second. Every word I've ever spoken, every deed I have ever done, from the beginning of my life to the end, that gets judged on Judgment Day. And so that's why normally, right away, it's like, oh gosh, it's a sermon on Judgment Day. 
I need a sermon on encouragement. I need a sermon that's going to pick me up here. But Judgment Day, how is that going to be encouraging at all? And I think you will see by the end of this, Peter says, oh, this is the most powerful encouragement that you and I can have, if you understand it rightly, that Judgment Day is coming. Yeah, everything I've said, every thought I've had, every deed I've done will be laid bare. It's kind of the way Peter puts it in our text. Laid bare. Everything done on the earth is going to be laid bare. So this I know, I'm not naive here, Judgment Day is about as repulsive to our culture as you can get. Like if I wanted to preach a text that would make our culture just recoil, this is the one, right? Judgment Day. Oh. This is why many people are like, I, this, is why I can't, this is why I can't believe in this God that you're talking about. This whole idea of a God who's wrathful, who's got this, this judgment coming on people, I, I can't believe in that. I can't buy that. I, I can only believe in a God who's loving and compassionate and forgiving, but this idea that God is going to bring wrath, I, I just can't buy it, Cliff. And we have to be honest here. You know the reason that a lot of people in our culture really do struggle with this is because sometimes it's been abused like there are people who have been very religious maybe they've gone to churches for most of their life and this is one of the reasons why they've checked out of what it really means to follow Jesus is because somebody has taken this idea of judgment day and instead of just preaching it as the word of God shares we try to use it to manipulate people we try to use it to create fear in people Hey, you better do as we say or else, you know, judgment's coming. And so people recognize that. They're like, yeah, that's why. But that's not what Peter's doing here, is it? Peter's not trying to throw a guilt trip on people and say, this is why you better listen, because of judgment coming. No, he has another thought in mind here. But I do think, even aside from that, there's something in each one of us that doesn't like the idea of judgment, because we know, man, every thought, every word, every deed... I've got some things in there that I'm not sure I want to have exposed on Judgment Day. And by the way, if you think our culture is like more enlightened, because a lot of people in our culture are like, well, that's why. You, you guys need to talk about a God of love, and I can't buy into God's judgment. I want to just tell you, there are cultures right now on this planet that have it exactly opposite as, of us. Our culture is like, I can believe in a God of love and forgiveness, but not wrath and judgment. But there are places on this planet right now where people struggle primarily with God being a loving, forgiving God. And when you talk about God's justice and God's judgment, they're like, that makes sense to me. You're like, well, why would anybody look at it that way? Well, if you've lived in a land or a place where war is the constant, like it's the norm, if you've lived in places where there have been genocide, Rwanda, where in three months, 800,000 people were butchered with machetes, killed. If you've lived in that context, and then you hear somebody come along and say, oh, there's a God who will forgive anyone of anything. That's hard to swallow. You're telling me that this person who butchered my family before my very eyes, right now, if they repent, they can receive complete forgiveness for all that they've done. And we say, absolutely. But you can see why our culture is not the way that all people see it. They've lived in some really difficult situations where will God ever call that to account? Will God have a day, a day of judgment, where justice is really served for all that has gone wrong in this world? And the answer is yes, he will. So we all struggle on different sides of this thing. Even in our culture, there's still a sense of justice. When injustice happens, and I know this is certainly happening now, it's always happened in our country, but at various times where you see real injustices have taken place, and in that moment, there's kind of this sense of, you hear the word, where's the outrage? Where are people standing up to say, no, this is wrong? Under any circumstance, this is wrong. And there's this sense of people, even in our culture, that struggles with judgment to say, there has to be justice done. Will there be justice done? And this is where God gets accused a lot. Because people say, unless there's outrage, unless there's some sense of speaking out, if you're silent, you're complicit with the injustice. And people then will say, where was God when that happened? Where was God when a mass murderer lets loose? 
Where was God when the child was abused and killed? Where was God? Why didn't God intervene? And I know the first reaction on the part of us as Christians a lot of times is, don't you want to step up and defend God a little bit? Like, Wait a second. You can't talk about God like that. He's a good God, and, and we try to defend God. But understand this. When somebody is saying, where was God? Why didn't he intervene? What they're really asking for is judgment. They're asking for justice. They're crying for it. They're saying you cannot have all of these terrible things happen without there being an accounting. And so we all actually want, that sounds weird, we all want judgment day. We all long for it when we're wronged. The problem, of course, is we also wrong others. So it's a false dichotomy here. This is important to split God's love from God's judgment. Don't, don't think, well, this is God's love, this is God's judgment, something completely different. God's justice and judgment are actually God's love in action. Because love simply, we've said this multiple times in this series, the reason that love is distressed by sin and injustice and wrongdoing is because love knows the damage that sin does and it cares about it. It matters to love whenever sin happens because it knows it's destructive. And so God, who is love, of course is distressed and says, and I will call it all to account. His love is actually what brings judgment. N.T. Wright puts it this way. He says, look, the biblical doctrine of God's wrath expressed fully on the day of judgment is actually rooted in the doctrine of God as the good, wise, and loving creator who hates, yes, he said, hates anything that spoils, defaces, distorts, or damages his beautiful creation, and in particular, those who are made in God's image. If God does not hate racial injustice, he is neither good nor loving. If God is not wrathful at child abuse, God is neither good nor loving. If God is not utterly determined in his wrath to root out from all parts of his creation in an act of holy wrath and judgment, the arrogance and the pride of human beings to exploit and bomb and bully and enslave and abuse and harm one another, if God doesn't have wrath towards that destruction, he is neither good nor wise nor loving. But Judgment Day tells us, oh, he is good and wise and loving because God says, oh, I will speak, I will act to put an end to this evil. So again, we're all for that when it's not us. So when it's my sin laid out there, then I, I've got a thousand excuses and extenuating circumstances, and this is why, God, I did this, and of course they did this first to me, and, and we have all of this, but on Judgment Day it gets laid bare. The person who believes in this doctrine, on the one hand, if you're like, well, I, I want to be a good moral person, but without the Day of Judgment, here's what will happen to you. If you try to be a good moral person without trust in the day of judgment by God's hand, then what will happen is you will go into two extremes. One extreme is you'll get apathetic because honestly, every day we can look at the, the headlines and say, oh, here it goes again. It's just overwhelming, the amount of sin and injustice in the world. And at some point you just be like, I can't do anything about it and you just give up. Like you just don't do anything. Or if you're a really active person, you're like, no, I'm going to, spit into the wind if I have to, but I'm going to fight this, and you fight injustice, and you try to come against all of the wrongs in the world, but at some point you will become cynical and bitter because you will realize your efforts alone, your power alone will never, ever do it because generations after generation after generation, it seems to just kind of crank on. Judgment, judgment day, makes a huge difference for those who understand and believe in the one who will do the judging and that is this, your sense of justice actually gets sharpened, not dulled. So because the reason that we look at Judgment Day and say, I actually work harder against injustice in this world, and I, I get a sharpened sense, I'm more distressed when I see it, 
not less, is because I know the one who judges is just. And judgment day is not about a, a thing. It's not about um, this event itself. It's about a person. And when you are fully involved in a love relationship with God, you want to be like him. And so your sense of justice goes up, not down. Even in fact that, that the world continues to just grind on with all of the wrongs that are happening, still your sense of justice grows because you are becoming like him. But on the other hand, you don't burn out. And here's why. Because you know, I fight against injustice wherever God calls me and however I can see it and he, he moves me to do it. But ultimately, it will never happen by my hand. And it will only happen by his and if you believe in a coming judgment day, then you can say with confidence, nobody gets away with anything. Nobody gets away with anything. So much that you read in the paper or whatever, well, this person's getting away with this, or this never got called to account. I'm telling you, judgment day says you have this confidence. God sees everything and nobody gets away with anything. Now that's terrifying when we think about ourselves as well, but it's a, it's a humbling, comforting truth. This is why on this, this doctrine, the, the day of judgment, Peter says it's going to be encouraging for you if you believe it. Like you actually have to believe Jesus is going to come back for it to make any difference in your life. If it's just a thought, well, I know they talk about this, they preach this, yeah, but I got, I got things to do. But if it's not, if it's embedded deep in your heart, then it will make a profound difference but you have to really believe it's going to happen. And Peter, when he's writing, is saying, I know you guys are hearing from false teachers and prophets. Remember, he talked about that last week. False teachers are telling you some things, and one of the things that they're telling you, apparently, is that Jesus is not coming back. Like, this is maybe a story the apostles worked up, kind of a cleverly designed story to control you, maybe with fear, so that they would have power over you, but that's not really going to happen. Jesus is not coming back. Peter's addressing that false teaching, and I think one of the ways that this false teaching played itself out from the other things that we've read in 2 Peter is this. Next week, you'll see Peter will mention the Apostle Paul. Peter and Paul, right? Well, they didn't really work together all that closely, but at one point here, next week, we'll see Peter will say, some people take what Paul has written which is scripture, and they will twist and distort it. And I think along these lines, like you could take something that Paul wrote in Colossians 2.12. Colossians 2.12 says, you were buried with him, meaning Jesus, through baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith. Now, we read that real fast. We're like, yeah, yeah, I got baptized, and it's symbolic. You go down under the water like you die with Christ. You come back out like you're raised with Christ. But these teachers would take that and distort it and twist it so that they would say, look, the reason that Jesus is not going to come back physically is because he was never raised physically. So where do you get that? Well, it says you were raised with him. Well, you didn't really die, did you? The false teachers would say this. You didn't really die, so Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. It's more of a spiritual thing. It's more like a, you know, the springtime, the hope of spring and all that stuff. And so Jesus didn't really physically rise from the dead. That means he's not physically coming back. And so all of this connection, say, yeah, but what's the big deal about that? Well, here's the big deal. If Jesus didn't bodily rise from the dead, and if he's not bodily returning again at his second coming, then the teaching goes this way. So your body really doesn't matter. Like your body, it's, it's going to die and it's going to go away, and what really matters is your heart. What really matters is kind of the spiritual intent of your heart and your mind. So your body, you could do anything with your body because your body really doesn't matter. It's not going to last. And it won't be raised. You won't get a new body. So it's just sex. It's just your body enjoying some pleasure. It's not a big deal. So consume it. Hey, it's just food and drink. So overindulge in it because it's just a body that's going to go away. It's just a fetus, so abort it. It'll make your life so much easier. 
All of these teachings are connected to this idea if Jesus didn't really physically rise from the dead, he's not physically returning, and that means your bodies don't really matter. And the teaching is going out, and Peter is saying, let's address this head on. This goes right back. If you don't believe that Jesus is coming, there's no judgment day. If you don't believe in that, it's going to be pretty easy for everything else to begin to slip. And so he says, so be prepared. And this is what I love about what he says. Look at verses 3 and 4. So above all, this is a teacher saying, listen, I know I lost you, but get you back right now. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Why is that important? Like, why does that matter that I, above all, know that when we preach this and when we teach this and when you're sharing it with your friends, your family, whoever God has you talking about these spiritual matters, that it would be important to know that people will not believe you? Why is that helpful? And I think it's because he's preparing you for spiritual warfare. He's saying, understand that they are going to come back at you and say, Here's why I don't believe that's going to happen. And the reason it's important to know is for your own heart so that you can say, God, help me work through this. So when we talk about having faith, it's not about turning your mind off. It's like really engaging your mind in ways you've never before and saying, no, God, help me to understand the argument here so that my own heart can begin to battle against that unbelief. But then if I've done that, if I engage that, then I can, as Peter would say, with gentleness and respect, not arrogance and not anger, but with gentleness and respect, give the reason for the hope that we have so that we can speak and say, I hear what you're saying, but that reason, let me tell you why it doesn't make any sense. What's the reason they gave here? Peter kind of quotes them. They will say, so where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. So the argument here is, the reason it's hard for me to believe that Jesus is going to come back is because everything has continued to go on and plow on for forever. Oh, when did Jesus say he's coming back? How long ago was that? That's like 2,000 years ago that Jesus said he's coming back. And every day since then just continues to plow on. Everything continues as it has. So the argument here is, there is something built into, they would say, creation that just kind of gets itself running keeps itself running so here's the question what do you believe keeps everything going do you believe it's the laws of nature the laws of nature yeah cliff that's what keeps the universe kind of cranking away that's what does it from the christian point of view we would say no actually if you believe that the universe the all of creation happened by accident hey, Cliff, it was, it was this kind of random series of chemical reactions and processes and physics working together, and this is how we ended up with what we got. And that means within itself is this power to sustain itself. That's why it keeps going. But the Christian view, the biblical view is, no, no, it's actually created by a personal God. He invented everything that we see. It's his idea, his imagination, and he gives voice to it and it comes into being. And therefore, it's an intentional, history has intention with that view, but if it's just accidental, here's the problem. There's a bunch of, they call them new atheists, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, if you've read or heard some of those guys, they call it new atheism, which just means it's in the last 15, 20 years. It's actually very much like the old atheism because it really comes down to this. If you really believe that all of creation is an accidental happening of chemicals and physics, then it is meaningless. You can't suddenly pull meaning out of an accident. It just happens. Even the way that you think would have to be ascribed to, that's just because of these series of chemical reactions and that's why I'm saying what I'm saying and thinking what I'm thinking. There's no meaning in life in that way. There's no story. See, story has meaning and purpose to it. It has an ending, a beginning, and, and, and all of those things happen only when there's intention. So the new atheism, which says, look, the reason that we say that there's no God is because, and this is what the new atheists do, they say, look at religion. Has religion helped our world? 
No, they've created holy wars. They've created all kinds of abuse. There's scandals all over the place. That's what the argument of new atheists is. Look at what religion has done. It's horrible. We need to do without religion. There is no God. And then, here's where they get kind of into a corner, whether it's new or old atheism. You say, so what is the basis for me doing what you say is the right thing? Because as soon as they say religion is bad, you know what they're doing. They're actually making categories here, moral categories of good and bad. And as soon as you do that, you're appealing to meaning and purpose. You're saying we should do, go for the good, avoid the bad. And you say, well, so where does that category of good and bad come from? And it's, it's, it's not funny, but it's interesting to me. They have to do backflips to say, well, this moral obligation is innate. It's innate. It's just there in a human being. And all humans should follow it. They actually don't think it's just kind of subjective. No, there's, a, there's an objective moral good that all people should follow. But when you press on that and you say, where does that come from? Why is that there? When everything else is just an accidental process, it's just innate. Well, I want to say that's about as clear a face statement as you can possibly get. Like you cannot have a face statement more clear than I can't see it under a microscope. I can't replicate it in the processes of science. I just believe that it's there. And it almost makes me think of Paul in Acts chapter 17. You remember when Paul visited Athens? And Athens was this super, super religious place where they said, look, there are so many gods in the world. We don't want to offend any of them. We're going to make sure that we have an idol for every one of them, including a, an idol to an unknown god. Because we don't know... We don't, maybe we're just not aware there's another God out there, but we want to cover our, cover our tracks here. So to an unknown God, we'll, we'll give you honor and, and we'll kind of worship you. And Paul comes along and he's like, so you guys are actually worshiping what you don't know. He said, let me tell you, let me proclaim to you what you worship in ignorance. Let me proclaim the truth to you. And that's what it sounds like to me. There's still this heart cry that says there has to be good and evil. We see it. We feel it. But the Christian answer is, of course you do. You know why? Because you're made in the image of God. You're created in the image of a good God. And when things go off track from who God is, His nature and character, you feel it deep within your bones. And so, here's Paul's, or, uh, Peter's guidance for us. We need to look at life in this very clear way of saying, it's not an accident, and the laws of nature don't just happen. So let me put it this way. Don't ever think that the laws of nature are a law unto themselves. You're like, well, what does that mean? Cliff, don't you believe in gravity? Come over to my house, climb my ladder, take a step off. I think we'll prove it. It's there. It's a law. But we only say it's a law by, by meaning this. It's consistent. Every time you drop something, it drops at 32 feet per second. No matter what the object is, that's the rate at which gravity pulls it and makes that acceleration happen. It happens every time, the same exact way. And so we begin to get this idea, so there must be this thing built into creation itself that makes it happen, whereas what the scriptures are really saying is this, do you know why things always fall at 32 feet per second? Because God says so. Because God wills it. Or, I love the way John Piper puts this, he said, the laws of nature are the tireless whisperings of the Almighty that God says, you're going to fall at 32 feet per second again, and you're going to fall at 32 feet per second, and you are, and you are, and God whispers it, God wills it. I think I've said this a thousand times here. We just assume, I assume, I've got another heartbeat coming here. It's, it's a little faster than that right now, but I've got a heartbeat going, and I'm like, it's just going gonna, gonna to pump. That's what they do. Uh, they call it, in medical terms, it's like you've got these autonomic systems in your body that just happen, right? But if this is true, what this means is this next heartbeat is God whispering it again. Cliff gets a heartbeat. Cliff gets a heartbeat. Cliff gets a breath. Cliff gets a breath. You're like, he's got to do that seven billion times for seven billion people on the planet. Do you see what God, when we talk, he's not just the creator, he's the sustainer. He's the one who wills it to continue. It doesn't just happen. That's why Peter says, verses 5 and 7, by 
God's word. Really important phrase here. He's saying, how did creation come about? It wasn't an accident. He said it was by God's word the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And then he ties it to the second coming, the judgment. By the same word. If it happens because God says it, then this is not just an idea. It is a rock-solid promise. I'm coming again. Well, that sounds like bad news, but it's not. He says, if you understand this, look at verse 9. We'll end with this. The Lord is not slow. I think this is the verse for us for the whole passage today. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting, this is big, not wanting anyone, all inclusive here, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So Peter says one of the arguments is that things just keep going by themselves. That's not true, he says. Only God wills it to be. But also here's the other argument. So much time has passed. But time, good and and bad are absolute categories, but time is a relative category. It is. Time is relative. You're like, is Peter quoting Einstein here? What's he doing here? He's, he's, He's basically saying this. You know this to be true. Time is always relative and it's based on a couple of factors. So for instance, time is relative to joy or the lack of joy. So if you are bored at a movie, a program, a sermon that is just dragging on and at some point you're like, oh my goodness, when is he going to wrap this up? And Because what happens is when we're bored, when we lack joy, time seems to what? stretch out it lasts forever oh my goodness but the exact opposite happens when you have joy isn't it you go on vacation let's say you get one two or three week vacation or something and you get to plan it you're going to go to this great place and you get you take your family you go on this vacation and you go on vacation and lo and behold everything works better than you even planned like the weather is perfect the whole time Everybody gets along. This never happens, but everybody gets along and you're having the best time on this vacation and at the end of that vacation, what happens to time? You're like, oh, it's time to go? It felt like we just got here. Time goes faster when you've got this joy going in your life. It happens with age. Age affects the way that we perceive time. The older I get, this happens. Some of you are doing the same thing. You're like, I swear, it was just yesterday that Laura and I got married. It's what it feels like. Like, we just got married, and now it's 34 years later. And we're like, where did the time go? And it happens the opposite for kids a lot of times. They think, oh, you know, I just went so fast. And it's like, just wait. You, you have no idea what fast is. Till you get older, and the time is just zipped by you. And it's like, well, that changes it. Here's the thing for Peter. You know what really changes time? Love. Love absolutely changes the way that you perceive time. And that's why he's making this argument with God. Do you know why God has waited? What seems so long to us? Why would God wait any longer? Love. Absolute love. Where he says the story's not over. Your story's not over. And God says, I am seeking you and seeking you and I'm not giving up. The initial response to most people to the day of judgment is, oh man, this is horrible. I can't even believe it. It makes me feel guilty. If you feel guilty when you think about the day of judgment, then you do not understand the gospel. Because the gospel looks to the day of judgment as one of the greatest revelations of the love of God. Because you know what's going to happen on judgment day? I'm going to stand and all of my life, my thoughts, my words, my deeds will be played out on a large screen and it will be ugly. I've told you this many times. If you guys knew the darkness in my heart, you would never come to hear me preach. You'd be like, why did we hire this guy? This guy's really messed up. If you really knew it, on judgment day, you will all see it. But on that day, and I'm somebody who, I'm in Christ, and I know that he died for my sins. I do. And I, I try to grow an appreciation for what he died for. God, I know that blackness of my soul, and you bore it on the cross. But I'm telling you, I don't even know the extent of the love of God for me. 
until the day of judgment when all of it's played out and then I realize, oh, he carried that too. He bore that too. See, the day of judgment is going to be an explosion of our love because we're going to see the one who died for us and I think I know what he did for me, but I don't know the half of it until that day is played out. Oh, so much more than I thought, God. So much more. And you're like, yeah, but what are those who aren't in Christ? This will be a terrible day of judgment. Yes, but do you see how his patience is saying, but you don't have to face it alone. Some of you are like, that scripture confused me where it says all of us have to stand before God on the judgment day. I thought we wouldn't have to do that because we believe in Jesus. Everybody has to stand before God on the judgment day, including Christians. The only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian on the day of judgment will be this. On the day of judgment, those who have not, by definition, put their trust in Christ will have put their trust in themselves. And you see this example. Jesus said there'll be some at that day of judgment who will stand before God and they will try to defend themselves. They will say, I know that doesn't look really good, but let me try to defend myself and show that I I deserve to stand on judgment day. And they will say, God, I I prophesied in your name and I cast out demons in your name and I I fed the poor and I, I did all sort of social justice and I did all of these things in your name. And Jesus will say, you never even knew me. There's no relationship here. You don't know me. You haven't put your trust in me. You've put your trust in yourself. And the only difference between a Christian and a non-Christian on the day of judgment will not be that we're somehow better. We are not. We are not. But the day that I stand there, I'll have a choice to say, I'll either try to defend myself or I'm going to say, you're right, that is ugly. I'm not going to speak for myself. I can only appeal to my Savior, my advocate. Jesus, will you speak? And Jesus says, absolutely. And on that day, Oh, it will be ugly. And he will say, but I bore that. Justice, you want to talk justice? He says, I'm bearing the punishment that you deserve. And my love will explode on that day when I realize how much more he's done for me. And so that's the only difference. You're either going to defend yourself, and we do that even now, don't we? No, no, it wasn't that bad. And we're trying to defend ourselves instead of saying, no, that's... I was wrong, and I can only appeal to a Savior to save me. It's not the good who are going to stand on Judgment Day. Who's going to make it through the judgment? What does Peter say? Is it good people? Is it people who go to church? Is it people who read their Bible? Is it people who pray? The only ones who will be able to stand on that day of judgment, Peter says, are the repentant. And repentance is not, I try to show God how sorry I am and then he's impressed. Repentance simply means that you turn to Jesus. That's what the word actually means, to turn. To turn to Jesus and trust in him instead of yourself. And you say, I know I deserve punishment, but he is willing to take it for me. The Bible makes it crystal clear. All have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then the gospel. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God's delay is his love. How many of you, you received Christ after 1950? That's 70 years ago. After 1950, if you received Christ, just raise your hand. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't come back in 1949? And you say, well, yeah, I guess that's, that's. Do, you, do you realize why? Because his patience. He's saying, yeah, but I love them. I, I want them. Yeah, but they, they're not going to accept you till the 1970s. They'll have bell bottoms on and all that stuff. They're not going to accept you. I don't care. Every day that God waits is God saying, that's my love. That's my love. There's still time. There's still opportunity today. And what does that say for us Christians? Every day. I don't care if we're in the middle of a pandemic or not, this has been on my heart, that we become a people that say, God, to make disciples is not just this project for us. That's our purpose, that's our mission to say, that's what it's all about, to get people connected to Christ, to his life. God, we just want to make sure that people know with gentleness and respect, not guilt, 
But there is a Savior who died for you, and He's waiting for you. I'll close with this. This watch up here, you ever, you ever heard about this watch? It's called the Ticker Watch, T-I-K-K-E-R, $59.95 if you're interested. Um, they do sell this still. It's, it's, a, it's a watch that when you buy it, you go to a questionnaire that this company has for you, and it asks you medical history, and it asks you some lifestyle um, kind of questions, asks your age, all that kind of stuff, and then it puts it through an algorithm, and they will give you an estimate of how long you have to live. No kidding. And then they plug it into the watch, and it counts down by the second, by the minute, by the hour, by the day, by the year. Estimated how long you have to live. It was created by a guy, he was from Sweden, and, and uh, he was a grave digger, no kidding. He, d he dug graves for a living for a while, and he said, you know what? Our culture just hates talking about death. I see it all the time. He said, I thought by having this countdown watch, it would inspire people to live each day to the fullest. Like, you, you, you know, it's counting down. You're, you only got so many days, so live it to the fullest. Not all the reviewers agree. Let me just read this one review to close this out. One reviewer said, it's morbid and it's not very stylish. So if you are wearing it until you breathe your last, you've spent your entire life with a pretty ugly wristwatch. But most importantly, he said, I don't think Ticker, I don't buy, he said, the positive spin on Ticker. I don't think Ticker would have me striving to drink deep of the cup of life. Rather, I think it would serve as this constant, inescapable reminder that no matter what you do, or what impact you try to have, this whole thing called life is meaningless. I think he's right if he doesn't know this truth. Oh, the story of God who says, I seeking after the lost, and I will come, and I will make all things right at the judgment. That means every wrong that's ever been done to you. And I know there's some pretty deep ones here where you're like, I will never see justice for that in my lifetime. That will never be able to be made right. No court of law, no human law could ever make that right. And I guess I just have to live with it. I'm telling you, the day of judgment is saying, I can't picture it, I can't imagine it or conceive it, but I can believe it. God says on that day, I will make all wrongs right and if you have that kind of a trust and says god no matter what happens to me i can put that in your hands that's why the bible says don't take your own vengeance but leave vengeance to god because he'll get it right i won't get it right i'll mess it up big time by the way ticker comes with a one-year warranty <laughs> on the watch not your life they actually have this legal disclaimer Ticker does not know when you are going to die. Ticker does not make any claims that you will be happier or have a better life. Ticker makes no claims to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Ticker is merely a countdown watch, and it's for entertainment purposes only. Can I just tell you, God has something way better for us than entertainment purposes only. And that is to live a life full of meaning, a lot of pain, but all of that we trust on Judgment Day. Oh, God will reveal His love, and He will also reveal His justice to make all things right. Let's pray.